Hi friends, and welcome to the By Faith Podcast. My name is Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. This season on By Faith, we're talking about the ins and outs of vocational ministry. I'm wondering if you heard my announcement in last week's episode with Christina M. that about six months ago, Nam approached me about bringing my podcast, By Faith, into their growing podcast network. They knew I'd announce this season of By Faith would be my last, but they said they want a podcast just for ministry wives by a ministry wife, basically what I've been doing this year. And they asked me if I would simply continue what I'm already doing, but with their help. Long story short, I said yes. So By Faith lives on, my friends. Starting in mid-August, I'll be releasing new episodes under a new name, the Ministry Wives Podcast with Christine Hoover. But it will be the same format you've come to expect from me. Personal, vulnerable, relatable, and truth-filled interviews with women all across the spectrum of ministry roles. I'm really excited about this opportunity, and I hope this gets you excited as well. Okay, friends, let's get to the show for today. I am so excited to share this episode with you. My guest is Mandy Post. Mandy and her husband, Jason, moved from Texas to Galway, Ireland in 2003 to plant a church. They have four children together, all of whom were born in Ireland, and they've served long-term growing and building a church, as well as growing as Christians and as cross-cultural workers. I asked Mandy to join me to talk about all sorts of things, how they were called overseas, what home means to her now, how she shares her faith with her friends, what she sees her kids experiencing as third culture kids, and how God has helped her endure when she's wanted to quit and pack her bags. If you're church planting or living far from your home, this episode will encourage you, I guarantee it. So here, friends, is my conversation with Mandy Post. I am excited to welcome my friend Mandy Post to By Faith today. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Christine. Very glad to be here. (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad that you're here and glad that I'm going to get to talk to you and my listeners are going to get to meet you and hear about your ministry. So will you start by introducing yourself and tell us about your family and where you are and where you're serving? Okay. So my name is Mandy uh, Post. My husband is Jason and we have four children, Emma, who is 17, Zoe's 15, Ruby is 13 and Wyatt is 11. They're all even numbers right now. It's easy to remember uh-huh. <laughs> or odd, odd numbers. So, so it's easy to remember. But yeah, so Jason and I live, or our family, we live in Galway, Ireland. Uh, we moved here in 2003 to start a church. We started the church then, and now we pastor the church. And we also work within our mission agency, our, our uh, organization, World Venture, and supervise our field. So the other workers that are here and um, are part of a Europe ministry team as well, that we supervise teams in Austria and Slovenia as well. So (laughs) yeah. Do you travel there quite a bit or? Well, not in the last two years, but yes, we we are meant to, meant to be. So we, we do actually have uh, plans to be in Austria. It will have been two years and we'll be there um, in April, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, little side note, Mandy and I went to college together. And her husband (laughs) went, we all went to college together. And so I've known Mandy and Jason, her husband for a long time, although we haven't seen each other in a long time, but a long time ago, Kyle and I went with a group of college students to Galway right at the very Mm -hmm. beginning of y'all's church plant. And so we got to be in your city and experience Ireland and I loved it. And actually we were there over St. Patrick's day. You were, yeah. Which was so fun. We went to the parades and all the bagpipes and the, you know, just the, the Ireland in full force. It was awesome. I loved it. Yeah. 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 It was great. We, we think fondly of that. that Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so you've been there a long time. I'd love to hear how God called you there to plant this church. Yeah. So Jason and I, we grew up together and started dating our last year of high school, dated all the way through college and um, got married after we graduated college. He started seminary. We, he had always had a call to ministry since high school. Um, and then by the time we finished university, it was looking like church planting. We were really kind of leaning that direction, church planting. And so when he started seminary, it was kind of, we were thinking, 
okay, well, we want to go where there's the biggest need. So we were looking in the United States and we kind of thought, okay, maybe the, you know, Northwest, uh, Seattle, Mm -hmm. um, Washington, Oregon, that kind of area, just very unchurched areas. So uh, then he took an intro to missions class (laughs) and we joined a church that was very missions minded and missions oriented and took a couple of mission trips um, overseas to Russia. Jason did a, a whirlwind trip through Europe. And just through, you know, narrowing all the paths, we, we looked and said, well, there are people going up to the Northwest, but there's not very many people going to Western Europe. So then once we settled on World Venture as our agency to go with, um, they sent us a slew of uh, the opportunities they had for church planning in Europe and landed, we landed on Ireland basically because there was only one couple here. Uh, with our organization and uh, they were you know due to retire probably in like 10 years from when we arrived and so we knew it would be they needed somebody so we just kind of kept narrowing it to where was the biggest need and um, that's how we ended up in Galway so (laughs) and you've been in Galway ever since since 2003 yeah since 2003 we were appointed uh, with our agency in 2001 and got here like a year and a half later which is crazy to think it was that quick, but yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. So Had all your babies. Almost. They're all Irish babies. Yeah. They are. They are. Yep. All born here. <laughs> that's so, that's so um, awesome. Well, so you've been there so is, long, yeah. which is why I wanted to talk to you. You've been overseas in the same place for many years. I'd love for you to, you know, my primary audience are Americans and I would love for you to tell us what you love about Ireland and the people and the culture there. Yeah. One of the things that we truly enjoyed when we first moved here is just a slower pace of life. Things take time and people don't mind. And that's, that's <laughs> fine. So, yeah. you know, I mean, there weren't even motorways when we first, but highways uh, completed, you know, across country when we first moved here. So you literally were driving through all these little rural towns just to get across the, the country. <laughs> so now we've advanced a little bit, but you know, it was, you know, slower pace of life, um, which means people value relationships over time. If they meet someone on the street or on the road, or whatever, they're going to stop and talk to a person and not, not necessarily think, oh, I've got an appointment I need to be at. They're going to stop and chat and, uh-huh. and put that person as a priority, as opposed to the appointment they have, which sometimes is frustrating because it means, you know, people don't show up on time, Mm -hmm. but our American ways of, you know, punctuality or whatever we've, we've adapted um, and have learned to appreciate and love the fact that people are priority over, um, over time, I guess. So that's, that's something we love too. I love, love, love living in this beautiful country. It is beautiful. I mean, gray, it's, it's gray. Most like we get rain 300 days a year. Um, so 65 days is, is dry or dry but um because of that it's so green and beautiful and like today the sun has shone all day long and there's no better place to be actually I mean it's just and you're surrounded by the sea so you have you know beaches and cliffs and we call them mountains but they're you know like big hills (laughs) but Uh still you know just so so much beauty here too and um yeah so it's just it's a lovely place to live and very family oriented like they They value family and children and, and they're a modest people, unlike the rest of Europe, they're more modest. And so, um, I appreciate that being from, you know, Texas, so our Southern modest roots, but, um, but yeah, uh, so there's, there's lots of things we love about them, but I'd say, you know, just the fact that they, they value friendship and relationship Mm. is, um, is just precious. Yeah. 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 It's a warm, a warm culture. It really is Mm -hmm. when we got there, it really is exactly how you picture it to be in terms of the green and, you know, there's sheep over here and there's stone (laughs) walls over here. And it's just so beautiful. Do you feel like you've become an out, uh, an insider or do you still feel like an outsider? No, we do. We feel settled. And I mean, it took a long time. (laughs) I would say the first 10 years I was, you know, if God said, pack your bags and go back to the States. I was ready, but, uh, we've been here 
so long. And even I would say like it took that much time for uh, people to accept us and trust us and recognize that we weren't going anywhere. Cause I still remember, you know, we have been here 14 years, you know, 10, 12, 14 years, you know, and people say, Oh, so like you're staying. <laughs> and I was like, well, we've been here. We've been staying for 14 years now, but yes, we plan on staying. <laughs> and so really I'd say in probably the last five years, people have, like, they don't ask, like our, our close friends, like they don't ask that anymore. People don't ask that anymore. They've accepted us. They've, they know uh, we're here to stay no matter what. So yeah. 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 And isn't, isn't your city pretty multicultural? It's not just Irish, but you have people from all over the world. Yes. Yes. And it, it, probably more so in Dublin, which is the capital city. Okay. Um, but, uh, but Galway is pretty eclectic in a sense. It's, it's really interesting. It has kind of, it's, it has two sides to itself because where we do have a lot of immigrants and multi, like a lot of different cultures represented. Um, we also have this very traditional conservative. We're the real Irish, like, like Dubliners will come here and Galwegians will say, you're not Irish. We're Irish. <laughs> like just because they're from the West side of, <laughs> of Ireland where we, and they speak the Irish language here, the Gaelic language here. Um, the majority is spoken where we're at. So, you know, they're the real Irish, you know, we're the real Irish over here, you know, kind of thing. But, but we do, we, we have a very um, diverse city, I guess, in that sense. And I mean, we're, we're quite small. We're 80,000 um, people, mm-hmm. but, um, but the third largest, well, we fight it with Limerick, but the third largest city in, in, uh, in our, all of Ireland. So, <laughs> yeah. What do you think Mandy has helped you become an insider and to feel, to be accepted by the people? It's just time. I, I honestly, I think it's just time. And I think uh, it takes a sense of humility as well to come in, not to come in and so when we first moved here, there's the small Christian community that is here. They were like, yeah, you Americans, you blow in, you blow up and you blow out. And that's what you do. And wow. so we, we knew that it was going to take years mm-hmm. for them to accept us, trust us. And then to just a, a humble spirit to come and say, what is the best way to do something here? <laughs> you know, we we're Americans. We're used to things being uh-huh. a certain way, but that's not, not the right way. It's, it's a way to do something. So help us help you in a sense. But yeah, we came to Galway because there were no other Irish people willing to come <laughs> uh, to Galway. So still haven't been, we're, we're still waiting for <laughs> <laughs> an Irish person to maybe take over the church someday. So, yeah. Okay. But you'll be yeah. there long-term you think? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, we, I, I mean, even, even if a, an Irish pastor were to come and well, we're hopefully raising up an Irish yes. pastor to, to, uh, yeah. to take our place, but no, we plan to still stay here and uh, support the church or even maybe help support someone else starting a new church in our area, like in the real rural part of them, of uh-huh. uh, our region. So that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. one of the things that you are passionate about is evangelism, which mm-hmm. comes with the territory of what you're doing, it does. Uh, it does. but not yeah. necessarily. I mean, someone could move and, and church plant and, you know, hole up in their home and be, be afraid of that kind of conversation. And so I would love for you to share with us some basic framework of how you share your faith with your friends. Okay. Okay. So I think funny enough, I mean, it's pretty natural because people hear my accent and, you know, what are you doing here? Why are you here? kind of, that's always the first question. And, um, and then those who know us well, who we've known for years, you know, they know why we're here. They know what we do. We came to start a church. We pastored the Baptist church in town. So for me to interject my faith 
or the reasons for the decisions I make, whether it be parenting or lifestyle choices, you know, I, I, it's easy to interject my faith. They, they don't balk at that necessarily. Uh So I feel comfortable. I'm at a level of comfort where I can interject my faith to uh, explain myself or, you know, the choices we make, the things we do, but yeah. uh, And then even just explaining that the way I make my decisions is based on the Bible and what, you know, I read in the Bible, what it teaches me and things like that. And then I think too, um, when you move to a new culture and you you're studying the culture and you're learning, you want to learn what are the things that are important to the, the people here and what do they value? Uh, what are the things that they celebrate in life? And so there's been natural conversations come up, uh, especially the year in school when our children are in the whole, when their classmates are all preparing for their Holy Communion, they have mm. to make their first commission, the first confession they do their Holy Communion. And, you know, a lot of these families only attend mass on this day. Like they don't, they're not, they're cultural Catholics. And so they're not, they don't know a lot about their own faith. So it's been interesting how many conversations have even come up just around those times when there's, you know, these special occasions in their own um, faith. And because I'm not from here, they actually have a feel of freedom to ask me questions uh-huh. or maybe even like, um, I, did, I wouldn't dare ask my priest this, but I'm going to ask you, or, you know, <laughs> but what do you think about um, confession and sin? And do you think kids even have sin to confess? And um, what do you, you know, and then repentance and it just, so it, it's been interesting. Some of the conversations I've been able to have just because of those cultural um norms that are here that have naturally led to to the conversations but it's just being aware of that opportunity coming up and um knowing your audience knowing your people and yeah and and then jason's favorite uh, question to ask people is what do you mean by that so uh because the, it's a cultural a, a catholic culture here the way they define things is differently so when they are, they're talking about grace it's not the same grace we're talking about. Like they actually receive grace through communion and, you know, the acts that they do and perform um, or just attending mass. So, you know, when you're in conversation and someone mentions grace, well, a good question to come back at is, well, what do you mean by grace? What do you mean by that? What does that mean to you? Because then it's hopefully getting them thinking more and then allows you hopefully an opportunity to say, oh, well, this is how I understand, you know, grace and different things like that so asking questions getting them talking and even thinking beyond their norm is is always good too Mm -hmm. so yeah what are some obstacles that you've come up against in sharing your faith and what have you learned or you maybe adjusted or implemented that has helped you overcome those yeah it's interesting so I I feel like one of the biggest obstacles here for Irish people especially because to be Irish is to be Catholic. So there, I, I wouldn't say it's extreme as Islam, but there is an ostracism that can occur if mm. you leave your Catholic faith. So it's a lot of prayer and time and love and patience given to people who are, who are starting to wrestle with faith and want to go deeper and want to maybe take it as their own and step away from the Catholic church. Uh, we've known, you know, people who their families have completely disowned them mm. um, and won't have anything to do with them because they have, or they, yeah, they, they either see it as a cult or it's just, it's not Catholic. So it's not right. So that's an obstacle for some of the Irish people. Um, and we just pray and uh, continue to share, you know, biblical truths and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to use, use it and convict them when the, when the time is right. I think there's also can be a general apathy towards religion because as one of Jason's friends put it early on when we moved here, um, your faith is telling you all the ways you can get to heaven, but my faith tells me all the ways I'm going to hell. So it's like, why even try? 
you know, like there's a sense of hopelessness and a sense of apathy almost that it's just a general feeling you get from, from the people here that mm. um, it's almost like you have to, it, so what we do, we, Jason has this great and I've used it before too, but do versus done. It's not about what you do. It's, there's nothing you can never do enough, but it's about what Jesus has done for you. So we, we bring it back to, to that and um, hopefully that spurs them to think, okay, maybe this faith thing can be for me. <laughs> maybe I can have a living faith in Jesus and truly trust in him. So, and then too, I think, you know, similar to like the Bible Belt where, you know, you grow up in the Bible Belt and you're a Christian just because of proximity to <laughs> the religion. I think there's some of that here too, where, you know, I was born in Ireland, so I'm Catholic, so I'm fine. There's, why would I even think anything else? There's nothing, you know, like there's just no thought to it. It's just, I'm, I'm okay because I was born here. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. both an apathy and a, um, uh, just like, Oh, I, I've already got it. Figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I mean, it sounds like you're saying the Catholic guilt is real, that it kind of is a cloud that hangs over. It is. Do, you, do you see when people come to faith, true saving faith, do you see the freedom? In yeah. Them? Yeah. Yeah. And just the, the joy that there's actual joy in faith and joy in God and that um, we can have joy in Christ and, and like my father loves me, you know, mm-hmm. just all those things that, um, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it, 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 it is. It's a beautiful thing to see. <laughs> yes. So and and mm-hmm. I say Catholic guilt, but I think we all can deal with mm-hmm. that at some level. It is our default setting to think we have to do something. And yeah. it's hard to understand that it's done and what that means. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't want to think it's just a Catholic thing, but so. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering how this has changed you because I know for me, when we moved to Virginia, even though it's still in the U S the culture is different and it really challenged Mm me and challenged me Mm -hmm. to think, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I do what I do? And how, why do we do ministry the way that we do it? And so I'm wondering how the Irish perspective and working with them, serving them for so long has challenged Mm -hmm. you and changed you. Yeah. It's interesting because when we first moved here, you'd get the, the response, well, why are you here? We're, we're, we're Catholic. We don't need anything else. Or we'd get the, oh, well, we have a lot of immigrants. So that's good. You're here because you can have a church for them, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, which is true. We do have a lot of, which is the beautiful thing about our church is it's very multicultural and it's a picture of heaven. But yeah, I think for us, it's, like I said before, it, we really had to, to scrutinize our ways. Like, you know, are we doing something because it's what we're accustomed to, what we're used to, what we've done in America, what worked there, or is it what's right for this context, for this culture? Um, so yeah, it's, it's been challenging. It's been humbling. You try a lot of things and you fail at a lot of things and then you discover that um, there are things that do work. And so you... So your ministry, you know, it, it evolves and, and grows. And and the more you have people from the culture involved, the more it actually looks like the culture that you're in. So, um, you know, that's what we, we just pray for and, and uh, hope for. But it, it, it definitely brings me to my knees, um, continuing to pray just that uh, barriers to the faith will be brought down and just the need for me to be uh, humble and vulnerable, admitting I'm not perfect, that I, I, I'm, I've been wrong. I don't want, because I think sometimes uh, the Irish can look at my life and think it's perfect and so, oh, and all these things, you know, everything's right, everything's good. She probably never yells at her kid. I actually had a friend say this to me, do you, you don't ever yell at your children. <laughs> and I, it was such a great opportunity to just say, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> If you could only be behind closed doors, yeah. but she had, she was struggling and she had yelled at one of her kids and really felt, you know, guilty over it and bad about it. And I said, 
I said, but that's the, the beauty is, is the reconciliation too, when you can come around and ask for forgiveness and, and talk to your kids about how we're not perfect. And yeah, so interjecting those gospel conversations. But um, so I think perspectives have changed. And again, you know, we've been here long enough now that the people that know us know us. And, and you know, hopefully we've let them see the good and the bad and the ugly of yeah. <laughs> my life. So. Do you feel sometimes more Irish than American or do you feel both? Like you kind of have two homes. Yeah, <laughs> I would say it's funny. I, I would definitely say I, this life here feels more normal to me. And um, when we go back to the States, it's hard. Mm. Um, and probably more so because we've raised our family here. I, I go back to the States and, and I forget like the parenting, th- like the things I need to know, like, don't start your car uh, in a parking lot to get the air conditioner to cool the car down with your while you're putting your kids in the car because someone could hop in and steal it or you know whatever. <laughs> like I had a family member tell me that because I I we were going to the parking lot and and I was like oh it's so hot I've got to start the car and get the kids cooled off we're not used to this heat and um and a family member came over and was like don't you dare leave your keys in the car running you know. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm in a big city. I, you know, this is anyway. Yeah. So yeah, I would definitely say things here feel way more normal than, um, than when we go back to the States. And, and I, ha- it, it is, it's an effort to switch the brain to think about where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah. Just, that's just a small, you know, a small thing, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Switching. And even the language here, cause they, they use different words and phrases and things and having to switch the language to use my American words. And, uh-huh. and yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, one more question about evangelism. I, I, this is my own personal question. I struggle with <laughs> maintaining there. I feel a tension between <laughs> serving the church, people who are already Christians, and then having time and space to make relationships with people who aren't Christians. And I think a lot of yeah. pastor's wives really struggle with this. And I just feel like I don't know how to land in in a sweet spot. Can you speak to that? Yeah. <laughs> I just say, amen. <laughs> yeah. I feel the tension so much and I have to be careful not to resent my Christian brothers and sisters or like, because we supervise, you know, uh, the other workers here and, you know, our other colleagues across, you know, I have to, you know, just in balancing my time and my energy, um, which I think I've come to discover it's not about time. It's about energy. How much energy do I have right now to give to um, mm, that's really good. certain people? Yeah. Um, but no, it's, uh, it's definitely attention. I have to guard my heart that I don't get resentful. So in that, I think some of the, the simplest things are the, you know, everyday moments when you, that you're interacting with unchurched people or non-church people, we, when we drop our, our children at school or collect them, bring them home, um, it, we call it a school run. I don't know if that's a, something else in, in America, but um, so those school runs are a really big deal here. Like that's where you meet um, the other parents and, and I have developed such close friendships just in those everyday moments. And they'll lead to, you know, a popover for a cup of coffee or a walk. Let's go for a walk, you know. Um, and so you just take advantage of those opportunities that are those simple everyday moments um, that, you know, may not even take a lot of time, but you're building on that relationship. And then you make time available when you have the energy to do it. <laughs> so another thing to... I, uh, Jason and I intentionally involve ourselves in third places. So, you know, your home is the first place, work is the second place. And then there's those third places um, where you can meet people outside of those other two things. <laughs> so we, we've found third places in um, fitness centers, um, swim groups and running clubs. So <laughs> that's all, all exercise. Um, but also like the, we've been involved in the school parents association. We've both been the chairperson a few different times and so we've gotten to know people that way and we're involved in the community in, in that that sense another fun thing that we did a few of the church ladies from church we did a book club 
And then we invited our unchurched friends to join us. And so we weren't reading Christian books. We were reading, you know, just regular old, you know, fiction books. But that was a way to combine our, you know, my both worlds, you know, yeah. the, your church friends and your unchurched friends. And it, it, it was great. And you eventually, you know, faith is, faith conversations are intertwined in those conversations. Uh So, so yeah, so I think, I think it's significant to have third places and just take advantage of those everyday moments. We will, you know, shop at the same shop and frequent the same local cafe, just because we know it's the thing, you know, you get to know the people that work there, but also it's the same people coming in to those places all the time. Mm. So you just build those relationships and, and, have a chat, you know, so, but yeah, I think to the energy thing, just knowing where you're, <laughs> when you can uh, give the energy to the, to different people. So I do like that. The difference between mm-hmm. time and energy, because yeah. you, it ch- has changed a lot for me over the years of parenting. Mm-hmm. When my mm-hmm. kids were small, my energy level was low and I knew I couldn't do yeah. a lot of outside things. So yeah. that's very helpful. So Mandy, what do you want Americans to know <laughs> about our brothers and sisters like you who are serving in other countries? Oh, so um, it's a great question. <laughs> I, it's funny. We usually joke uh, with, with friends and family back in the States that, uh, you know, all believers are called to missions. We just chose to do it in a different location. So, you know, we're just doing it. We're doing the same thing that all believers are called to do. Um, we just are doing it in a different country. But um, all that to say, it, it, to be a successful Christian worker overseas, it takes time. So when you move to a new place, uh, you're not only learning and studying the culture and the history of the culture, why these people are the way they are, um, what motivates them, what they value, um, but uh, you're, you're learning the language um, and they do speak, speak a different English here, that's for sure. <laughs> but um, but uh, you're learning how to do normal everyday things, how to shop, how to cook, how to bank, how to drive, <laughs> you're you're learning how to live life in a whole different way so there's a there's a time period where when people move overseas they need that time to adjust they're not going to it's not like a short term trip or a short term you know internship where you're going abroad for 3 months and you're just going to hit the floor running uh no uh, if if you want success long term it's an investment those first two years, at least two years and one to two years, but at least, I, you know, some places two years because you're learning a whole new language and you have to then, you know, order things in a whole new language or, um, <laughs> right. yeah, shopping, all, all of that. So I think that's just one thing to keep in mind, um, especially if you support uh, mm-hmm. workers overseas. Uh, just remember the ministry comes, it will come, but first you got to learn how to live life. <laughs> live yes. and survive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're being really kind that we're, you're saying we Americans, I'm going to say we Americans are so intent on accomplishment and success that we have a hard time defining that when it comes to biblical success. So, yeah. I mean, we've, we felt some of that pressure church planting that you have to, you have to kind of prove to your yeah. people who are supporting you that you're doing something. Yeah. And for, for Americans, yeah. that means numbers and that means growth. Yes. And, and so mm-hmm. it can be, I would imagine it could be kind of discouraging for people like you who are moving, like you're saying two years just to get settled and adjust yeah. and learn the language. That's a different, uh, definition of success than yeah. the Americans often have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we joke, you know, it was funny. Our colleague said we, uh, only went to the shop once today and we didn't burn dinner. Is that success? We were like, yes, that, that is success. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a whole, a whole new ball game. I think another thing to remember too, is when people have been here long-term um, they're changed. We've talked about it already, but, uh, but I love uh, how one of my colleagues in Austria put it. He said, part of living cross-culturally is that you don't ever get to go home again. The you that left isn't the you that comes back. 
And the home you come back to is never the same as the one you left. Oh my gosh, so, that is, I resonate with yeah. that. I cannot even imagine yeah. cross-culturally. Yeah. yeah. It is kind of so sad. It's, like there's a sadness to it that you realize you gave up home, a feeling yeah. of home. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a grief. And we're, tra- well, if you get good, good training before you move overseas, you're trained in how to grieve well and how to say good goodbyes mm-hmm. every time you leave. Cause you're, cause you're traveling back and forth, you know, for home assignments to mm-hmm. raise more support or update, you know, um, your supporters on the work that's going on. And so you're traveling back and forth regularly. And so there's a lot of goodbyes and a lot of grief. And uh, we were told before we moved, you know, for every year you live overseas, when you go back to the States, it's going to feel like two. It'll feel like you were gone for two years because so much has changed. Everyone there has lived a whole year of life. You've lived a whole year of life separate from each other. So when you come back together, you're going to feel this tension that there's, um, you know, it's been longer than it actually has been. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just it's been, good. but it's okay. It's okay because it's all part of the, the growth. Um, the other thing I'd say is, is our children our third culture kids is what they're called, uh, MKs or missionary kids is what they would have been called before. But just to give example, using our own children, uh, being born here and raised here, uh, in their heads, they're Irish, in their hearts, they're, they're Irish. But their Irish classmates, uh, teachers, see them as American. When they go back to the States, uh, they're American. You, you value and love all the things that, that we love because you're, you're American. And um, so they don't feel either. Like it's really, there's, so they feel most comfortable around other children like themselves who, you know, are bicultural you know, and um, have this dual kind of, uh, of life. So we, we often talk about our identity is not in one or the other, but it's in Christ. And we pray our children can embrace that as well. Um, you know, our citizenship is in, is in heaven. Our home is neither here or there. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter what our passports say. <laughs> um, our identity is in Christ and our citizenship is in heaven. So, um, but yeah, we still have to feel sad about the other, you know, mm-hmm. not feeling one or the other. But yeah. That's so good. Thank you for sharing yeah. that with us. I'm wondering yeah, what yeah. you, what you would want Americans to know and understand about ourselves based upon where you sit and serve what you see? Yeah, this is a, it's a challenging question. I know, I, I, I know. <laughs> but, I but, but we want to know, we want to know. <laughs> well, I think honestly, I think it kind of, it does go back to that identity in Christ. Um, I mean, I was born and raised American, you know, I didn't know what was what I held to and what I clung to until I moved away. Yes. And it's not until you step into another culture, you step into another person's shoes that you, you see things from a different perspective and you learn things from a different perspective. Um, but even if you don't move to, you know, another, a new culture, I think that's always something good to remember that there are different perspectives, different ways of doing things. And they have nothing to do with the Bible, <laughs> you know, like, so when it comes down to it, just get down to what the Bible teaches. And um, that's our core. That's, that's our, that's our center. And again, so that's where our, our identity is in Christ. It's not in being American or being Irish or whatever um, above all and for all, you know, Jesus is, we, we are representing him. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah. You did a great job with that question. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering, can you give an example of something that you realized when you got there that it wasn't necessarily biblical, but it was tradition for you and that you changed? Yeah. Oh. Um, well, okay. <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is language. Right. So I grew up a good Southern girl uh, in Texas and, you know, fart, but shut up, stupid. Those were all bad words, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. so, 
ladies don't say those words. <laughs> and that's how, you know, I was brought, brought up. And I remember when my firstborn was a baby and she passed gas and the mom goes, oh, she farted. That's so great. You know, and it <laughs> like, I was like, no, she tooted. She didn't fart. <laughs> you know, like, so it's just, um, but also in that there are other words um, that, you know, are said here and, and are accepted and uh, rub me the wrong way. So, you know, even in working with youth, they'll be like, that's not a bad word here. You're an American. So you think it's a bad word. And, um, and so even, you know, I would teach them, well, if you know, it's a bad word to me, would you please refrain from saying it in front of me? (laughs) But, but even just giving grace, uh, to other people in those kind of differences that mm-hmm. we can both be believers and fall on different sides of yeah. it. It seems like there's definitely a, a stereotype of Americans thinking that they know the right way and they're going to come in and they're going to save the day. Yeah. Yep. And <laughs> I love that you've kind of spoke to that already of just trying to learn, trying to mm-hmm. be humble, trying to, you know, just be there long-term so that you can, you can, you can be credible in the culture that you're in. So thanks for speaking to those things. I know that's a little bit hard to answer for, (laughs) um, (laughs) but I'm wondering as I was preparing to speak to you, I just thought, I wonder if she's ever wanted to give up. I mean, I know the answer is yes, because I think we all yeah. At times when I get up and you've already alluded to it, that you said within the first two yeah. years, if God had said, you can go home, you would have packed your bags. So how yeah. have you endured in ministry where you are yeah. for so long? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, a lot of <laughs> prayer and, you know, I like to journal, so I just scribble it all out to God. Here's my heart. And, you know, it, different things bring on that desire to quit or give up, Um, you know, there's homesickness, there's frustrations in ministry, there's team dynamics that, you know, you're not, your team conflict, Um, just the the day in and day out of the stress and pressure of living in a different culture and having to think through a a lens, you know, or a a different uh, lens to process situations. And so um, you're living at a higher level of stress just on a day-to-day basis, but those things, are also the things that uh, that grow us, right? Just because um, God calls you to something and it gets difficult doesn't mean it was wrong. <laughs> doesn't mean God made a mistake. Um, as a matter of fact, Jesus says, you know, you're going to have trouble in this world. And so uh, I think oftentimes we're called to something, it's right, it's good, does not mean it's going to be easy. And um, it's more about the work that God is doing in us than the work that he's doing through us. So there's this transformation that, that's happening. And, and I, I that when something difficult comes, you take it to the Lord, you fight it out, you wrestle just like David, you know, in the Psalms and, and you're, you're bringing it to him and then he is restoring you're renewing your salvation. He is renewing your joy in your salvation. He is restoring your confidence um, and building you up for what, what lies ahead. So I think remembering those things that, that, and I think too, remembering that first initial thing that pricked your heart, that got you out of uh, where you were, that got you where you are, you're at. You remember that and you cling to it and it reignites that fuel and that passion that you originally had to go where you're at, to be where you're at. Uh, And then to, like, God has just consistently said, your work's not finished. I'm not finished with you there yet. And the funny story is uh, we had lived here five years and they changed all the visa laws here. And we no longer had a visa we could apply for. The only thing we could do was apply for citizenship. And so we applied for citizenship and it was a four year waiting period before we found out if we were going to, before we were approved. But in those four years, you know, they could have sent us back to the States any of those, any of those years and they didn't. And then we were approved. And then it's like, well, now we have, 
not just a long-term visa, but we have citizenship in Ireland. So I think, yeah, I think this is God saying, um, I'm not done with you yet. (laughs) And now you can stay there as long as I need you to stay there. So even just something like that was huge affirmation. And so on those moments when I'm struggling and I, I just want to be done, mm-hmm. I go, but wait, God has affirmed, God has, has, mm-hmm. uh, and so you have those remembrances, you have those stones of rem- you know, remembrance that you cling to and come back to, and then you just let him work in your heart. And if in the end, mm, all ministry fails, that you look more like Jesus, I look more like Jesus, then God's work was done, you know? Wow. So, it's so good. Yeah. I love that you use the word remember. I, anytime I meet somebody who, you know, they're in the very beginning of church planting or whatever, I say, write down everything, write down everything that God is saying to you, how yep. he's providing for you. Oh yeah. Write down everything you can think of because it will not be long before you forget <laughs> and you start doubting and you think, yeah. oh, how do I get out of this? Cause it's too hard. Yeah. So yeah, I love that. And that's a very biblical thing. God is always telling people, remember, yes. remember. Yes. Yeah. So final question, yeah. Mandy, I, I would yeah. love to know what you've learned about God through living in Ireland yeah. and seeing through Irish eyes. Okay. This brings tears to my eyes. I get, I'm get emotional even just um, thinking about it, but because there's so many things I love about this culture. Uh, but as I've mentioned before, the, I mean, the people here are wonderful. They have my heart. And one of the main things I love about them is that they highly value relationships. So you see it in the way they'll stop on the road to have a chat with someone and the traffic starts backing up and <laughs> they just, they don't mind the people behind them because they're in the conversation. And you know what? The people behind them don't mind either. <laughs> they just sit and wait patiently. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Know. You know, or, um, you know, you're out for a walk and uh, you meet a neighbor on the road and, you know, you stop, you chat. There's no question that you're not going to like a- at least acknowledge each other. Um, so, so yeah, just the value of, uh, of relationships and people and placing importance on, on human beings and uh, giving them time and attention and energy. I, it just makes me think of God and how he values us and, and longs for us to be in relationship with him. And he loves us and wants us to, to spend time with him, to be with him. And so it's, it's, uh, it's yeah, a joy just to, to be a part of a culture that values something that God values. Oh yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us. This has been really encouraging to me. And I hope to those listening, I love to get to talk to women all across the globe because it reminds me that I'm not alone, that what I'm doing, I have my little plot of land that God has called me to, and you have your little plot of land. Yours is beautiful um, to, to cultivate and all those listening, they have their little plot of land, but we're all serving alongside one another. We're not alone. God is at work all across the world. And that's, that's what I take away from this. Just being very encouraged. So thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for listening to By Faith. Before you go, I do want to remind you that registration for Lifeway Women's Online Bible Study of my Matthew study, Seek First the Kingdom, is happening right now. In fact, registration closes soon, so if you're considering jumping into the study with me, now's the time to do so. If you register, you'll get free teaching videos in your email once a week that prepares you for the week's study in the workbook. You also can join in discussion with thousands of women all across the globe, and you can do the study as an individual or with your small group, but you need to know that the videos start rolling out on April 21st, so now is your time to register. Head to lifeway.com slash seek first to register today. Join me next week on By Faith as I talk with Marcella Hernandez, a pastor's wife in New England, about discouragement and ministry. Until then, friends, have a great week and keep walking forward by faith.